Well, today I'm going to talk about the possible impossibility. The possible impossibility. Those things don't even sound like they go together, but with God all things are possible, even the impossibility. And so I'm going to talk about that today. You know, Scripture tells us, we're all aware of this, it says to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, when it says all the world, what does that mean? Well, that means to the people you can reach as well as the people you can't reach. It means the people you love as well as the people that you don't love, the people that you refuse to reach. You know, how many of you know we have our little sweet spot of people that we get along with better than people that we don't get along better with. God wants to talk to you about that. We also know the Bible talks about the golden rule. The golden rule, what is that? It's do unto others as you would have others to do unto you. I'm going to particularly stay in the book of Luke this morning. Luke says it like this in chapter 6, 31. He said, and as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. And and then perhaps when I have time, I'll read the, the rest of that verse later. So, so we have others. How many of you know what others are? Others is not yourself. Others is not your family. We have guests. How many of you realize what, what guests are? And then we have a completely different category. We call them strangers. How many of you know you teach your kids to stay away from strangers? You know, you, you understand the difference. And, and we have to be connected because how we treat them displays back on ourselves because God is love. And he said not just to love your neighbors, but he said to love your enemies. So here we have hostility playing in the game. So, so love your neighbor as yourself is what Jesus said. And I want to pray for you right now. And I want to ask, I'm not, gonna, I'm not challenging your thinking today, I'm encouraging your thinking. I'm going to encourage every one of you to think for yourself. I'm going to encourage every one of you to think according to how God thinks. I don't want to challenge you. I want to encourage you this morning. It's 2023, and I believe that the Lord is saying for us to host the impossible. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Help us today to understand, to receive, to grow to think, to not be afraid to think for ourselves, to not be afraid, Lord, of what others think, especially, Lord, what others think. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, that loving your neighbor as yourself, how many of you admit that we sometimes have problems with that? Yeah. Sometimes to, you know, to help somebody or then this idea that the Lord spoke to me two weeks ago, he, he asked me this question, it's a part of my sermon today, but he said, would you help someone that you knew would later exceed you? I said, absolutely. Because we've, we've learned, and, and, um, and I've got some of my South African ministers and friends here, that they've heard this saying before, is that you're success is my honor your success is my honor i want to be a part of your success i want you to exceed me i want my kids to stand on my shoulders reach higher than i ever reached but that's not just for my kids that's for you that's for this whole body because i'm like a, a spiritual father i'm like a pastor you i want to see you do well in life one of the ladies that i've been studying from her name is dr crystal downing and she told the story about when she was in the university attending university at an undergraduate level one of the students in her class could not be contacted she could not be around things she could not be around people she could not touch books or hold books she couldn't you know she had special clothes and gloves that she wore and things over her her head and a mask and and crystal saw this student saw this student that she felt sorry for and she wanted to help this young lady out and so she agreed to meet this young lady at the only place that was allowable for the two of them to meet which of course was her home so crystal goes to this student's house and 
the student was inside and she was, to say she was careful, let's just stretch it a little further and say that the student was actually afraid. She was afraid of her surroundings and she was afraid of people in general. And to help, to show Christian hospitality, Crystal went to her house, she knocked on the door and the door was opened up about this wide and a packet was handed out the door to her. And she took the packet and she's like, I don't know what this is. And the girl said, go and take your clothes off and put these clothes on. And so that's what Crystal did. She just went and changed her clothes, put them in a bag and put these clothes on and she was allowed to, to come inside. And when she came inside, when she entered the house, she saw to her amazement that everything in the house, the walls, the furniture, the dishes, everything was covered in aluminum foil. Everything in the entire, there was not a picture hanging on the wall. There was nothing that was not covered. You see, her mother had told this child, this young lady who was attending university, that everything in the world was an allergen. Everything in the world. Now the truth is that we know that's not true. That actually this mother was mentally ill and she had impressed upon her daughter that everything in the world was an allergen. And so she lived in a world where everything was foreign or adversarial. Everything, now put yourself in that place, put yourself in that world. This is a true story, I'm not making any of this up. Crystal wanted to help this girl and found out that she lived in an aluminum foil house. How many of you know that sometimes we live in our own houses and we have our own peculiar, peculiarities, we just don't always recognize them? And so we have these foreign things that apply in our lives, which could be foreign people or it could be foreign ideas. How many of you, you know, you feel uncomfortable around some foreign people? That's everybody. You don't speak their language. They dress different. They have different customs. That's, that's why I'm so thankful that I've traveled all over the world. I've seen so many different cultures and different things. It's given me an appreciation for each and every culture. And when I go into that culture, I'm always aware that I am the big, ugly American. Because Americans are probably the most arrogant people in the world. Maybe next to the French. I got to put the French way up there. Um, yeah, I don't know if I should tell you this story or not. I was in a long line waiting to get on to a plane in Africa, and this French guy passed me and passed everybody up and got in the front of the line. He did it only because he was French. How many of you guys know me? I'm not just American, but I got a little bulldog in me too. How many of y'all realize that man did not get on that plane in front of me? Because I just, you know, thank God I'm a little more mature now than that. <laughs> but how many of you know as Americans we have our way, French people, they have their way. We, we go into different countries and I recognize I'm the foreigner. I've got to adapt myself to their beliefs, to their customs, to their ways. And that's only right. But you know, we can sometimes live in a what I call a small world. I read this world famous astronomer and his wife happened to be giving people a tour and she came in and said, oh, that's my husband, the astronomer Fred. He lives in his own little small tiny world. He was looking through a telescope. How many of you realize the world he was living in was way bigger than the world she was living in but she said his own little tiny world. I mean, you know, we have a, a tendency to shrink things down. But I refuse, and I want to ask you today to refuse to live in your own you verse. You verse. What is a you verse? A you verse is where everything is about you. 
How many of you understand now the U-verse? I didn't say universe, I said U-verse. Refuse to live in your own U-verse. And, and many people, including Christians, live in this made-up land where they're the center of everything. And this particularly described the Jews when we're reading the New and Old Testament because the Jews lived in their own world. I mean, they were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for him to come to do what? To make them number one. That's what their life consisted of. But Jesus said, no, no, no. Wait a minute. The kingdom of God is for everyone. Well, the Jews didn't like that, and that's how they missed the Messiah being very selfish. And uh, they were right about everything, and everyone was out to get them. How many of you know you can have those feelings? I'm right about everything. Everybody's against me. I mean, you know, after a while, maybe you realize you're the common denominator in all of this mess. It's maybe not them, maybe it's partly you. You know, Galileo went as far as to get himself killed by the Catholic Church because he dared to say that the earth was not the center of the universe. He dared to say that the sun did not go around the earth, but the earth went around the sun. He dared to say that the earth was not flat, but the earth was round, and they killed him for it. Who's they? The church. Because they wanted to believe they were the center of everything. How many of you can right away see and understand you are not the center of everything? Get out of your U-verse. Get out of your aluminum-wrapped houses. Get out of that place. And remember, I'm not, I'm not challenging you. I'm encouraging you today to go to, to different levels because the opposite of self is others. Right? The opposite of me, it can't be me, it's got to be you, it's got to be others, the opposite. And so we're going to talk a little bit about hospitality today, and we're going to break hospitality down in ways that probably I would venture you've never broken it down this way, because too many people only offer hospitality to a stranger if that stranger already shares their fundamental worldview. You know, I'll be nice to you because you look like a nice person. Well, what does a nice person look like? Somebody that looks like me, right? That's what a nice person looks like. You look like me. You talk like me. You like the same chicken I like. I mean, we can be friends, but yet that's not, that's not anything to do with a stranger. But is the stranger, you know, if he's the same color, same beliefs, same haircut, same clothes, you know, all of those things. But we don't share hospitality with allergens, do we? We don't share hospitality with allergens. And remember, allergens can be people, but allergens can also be ideas. We don't share hospitality with allergens. Augustine, and it just depends on if you're in Texas, we call him Augustine. If you're in scholarly ranks, Augustine, but anyway, we're in Texas, so I'll call him Augustine. You all know 4th century Father Augustine of the church. He said this, he said, Whoever therefore thinks that he understands the divine scriptures, or any part for that most, and he does not build the double love of God and of our neighbor, he does not understand it at all. In other words, Augustine said, it's not what you know, it's how you love. He called it the double love. You say you know the scripture, but you don't understand the double love. What is the double love? The double love is loving God, loving yourself, and loving your neighbor. He said, if you don't understand that double love, he said, you don't understand anything at all, period. And so some are more exact in holding the rule of God rather than allowing the love of God to change them or to change others. How many of you understand this, that there are some that are so interested in winning an argument that they had rather win an argument than keep a relationship? You guys know I'm stepping on your toes, right? But I'm not doing it to challenge you. I'm doing it to encourage you. So let's just think about the dichotomy of Jesus when Jesus came into a world full of morons. 
You know, I preached on that last Sunday, if you were not here, where Jesus prayed in John 17, I finished that what you called me to do. Now I ask you, Father, to return me to the glory I had with you before the foundations of the world. In other words, Jesus didn't talk about science, he didn't talk about medicine, he didn't talk about government, he didn't talk about a lot of things that he had every right to talk about because he was the smartest guy in the room. But what did he choose to talk about? What did he choose to demonstrate? It was not how much he knew, it was how much he loved. Are y'all getting this? How many of you realize you can't sit down and outthink Jesus? You can't sit down and outdo Jesus. But he was not, Jesus was not interested in outdoing people. I mean, even though we were compared to him morons, I love this, that the scripture says, yet he is mindful of us. Let me give you just an English easy interpretation. He thinks about us continually. In other words, God got down in the sandbox and played with us. Now, you know, I had my first granddaughter born on December 13th. I went in and saw her once, prayed for her, pulled the pastor's card, you know. They wouldn't let me go in, but, you know, I got in. How many of you know there's a will, there's a way? Laid hands on her, prayed for her, got that done. She came home a few days ago, uh, but I haven't had the chance to see her since the day she was born. I took my daughter to the hospital on Thanksgiving Day. She stayed in the hospital until only a few days ago when she got released. And so, you know, I would love more than anything, I would love to be able to go and to, to see this little baby. And, and you say, well, what are you going to do when you see this little baby? Make baby noises. I'm going to goo goo and wah! And make all kinds of noises. Why? Because it delights me to get off of my high horse and get down in the floor and play with the baby. God loves you so much. You think you're so smart? Every time he speaks to you, he gets in the sandbox with you. And yet the Bible says he continually thinks of you. God is love. He said, they will know that you are my disciples. They will know that you are Christians. They will know that you are mine, not by your argument, but by your love. You know, first century Christians didn't even testify at all, period. They didn't, no testimony. Uh, one of the, the most famous guys, they, they went to, to execute him. They lit him up. They burned him by fire. And he said, do you have anything to say? And he said, oh, it is what it is. Let's get on with it. Because their life was such an example of love. Their lifestyle was such an example of love. They were so acceptant of women, so acceptant of children. They went into, the, into the, the, the dumps, and literally the Romans were putting their babies in the dump pile. For, to, they called it exposure. They died by exposure. And these Christian people were taking these babies out of dumps and bringing them into their own home and raising them as their own children. And the Romans were so amazed by that that what happened is they were winning the world by the testimony of their life, not by the argument of their mouth. But how many of you realize that we live in God's world of allergens? There's allergens all around us, and true hospitality welcomes allergens. I had a friend, Heath Hagemar. His mama, you know, first baby, she took care of him. She was perfect. If his passy dropped, she boiled it, she cleaned it. Kid was sick continually. Went to the doctor, same doctor that I went to when I was a kid. We grew up together. And the doctor said, there's nothing wrong with this kid. She said, well, he's sick all the time. He said, well, take him home and go out in your backyard and dig up a pile of dirt and give him a teaspoon of dirt every day. She's like, you got to be crazy. What in the world? you got to be crazy. He said, no, the problem with this kid is that he's not been around any allergens. That's why he gets sick all the time. She went home. She went out yard. Doug gave him a teaspoon a day. Healthiest kid I knew. Because he wasn't around allergens. You see, Luke 6.31, as... 
And as you would that men should do to you, Jesus said, do you also unto them. I'm going to stay in Luke. Luke 14, verse 12. And Jesus said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now, that's not what most people do, you know. I know over the holidays, I've spent a lot of time inviting homeless people, not just to buy them a meal, but to eat with me. Come on in. I had this one guy, I, I fed him uh, Brickshire, uh, Popeye's chicken. Dude had a, like a little bag, and he had some shoes that were not nice shoes, but they were better than the shoes he was wearing because he didn't want to wear out his nice shoes. I, I brought him in, and I fed him. And before I was leaving, the manager called me over and said, hey, would you please, I said, just, you know, will you take him with you? Will you <laughs> take him out? Will you escort him out? And I said, well, well absolutely, sure. They said, well, we've had, we've had some problems with him. I don't remember now his name. I'll call him Fred. I was like, all right, Fred, I'm done. You know, I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to Houston now, and, and uh, I need you to come with me because I'm leaving. You need to leave. And he was, yes, sir. I got Fred's little stuff and walked out. You know, Fred's never going to repay me for that. But how many of you know hospitality is not what you do with your friends? Because all that is is mingling. We like to mingle a lot, don't we? But that's not hospitality. And you know what? When we deconstruct, deconstruction exposes the inconsistencies of the aluminum foil that is in the house that we believe in. We've wrapped our houses with aluminum foil to keep the allergens out, to believe what we want to believe. But what I've discovered is exposure happens best when an element outside our belief system somehow enters inside. Remember, I'm challenging you to think. You have to think today. And so people have the tendency to believe that what is in their house is holy, even though it might be all aluminum foil. What I have are treasures, what you have is junk. How many of you, you know that philosophy, you know, I have treasures, you have junk. What I believe is better than what you believe. How many of you understand that rationale of thinking? I love this. Psychologists did this test on, on self-esteem, and they tested uh, pre-med students from NYU, New York University pre-med students, and then they tested as a counter to that a gang that was on the streets of New York right there. And what they discovered to their amazement was that the gang members actually had a higher self-esteem of themselves than the medical students did. Now, how can you figure that? How can that be? These medical students have been co competing their entire life. They've been working towards this high, high, the highest level degree there is to become a, a doctor. And yet these kids out in the streets who were brats and running crazy and doing bad things felt better of themselves. Well, because these medical school students had been exposed to so much, they didn't think they were nearly as smart. These gang members were so smart that you couldn't teach them anything. Ah, who were the smart ones? The medical school students. You see, sometimes we get caught up in that. What if, if we take a redneck and a hippie? Uh, what if we take a, a liberal and a conservative? What if we take whatever you can fill in the box with, you see, just kind of like these opposites, and we put them together, and all of a sudden, the redneck decides that that hippie's not all that bad. The, the conservative guy says, you know, that liberal person is really not all that bad. Then what do we believe? We think in ourselves that that must be an exception to the rule, because we know all of those are bad, but maybe this one's not representative of the group. Remember, we're thinking here. I have a dear friend, a dear friend. I'm going to tell you two funny things that happened all in the same conversation. 
And he's a dear friend because I've led him to the Lord. He's in church this morning. He doesn't live here. He lives in East Texas, one of my East Texas hunting buddies. And he told me one day, he said, Rusty, he said, I just want you to know, he said, I'm not prejudiced, I just hate, and he used the N-word. And I won't call him by his name, but I told him, uh, that's the definition of prejudice. In the same conversation, the exact same, I'm trying to relay the level of understanding to you so you can get us some understanding. I lived in a small world, he lived in a very small bubble. In the same conversation, he discovered he was also a fornicator. <laughs> you say, what? He said he's prejudiced and a fornicator. We, we're having this discussion about God, and it covers everything. How many of you know God covers everything in your life? Everything. And he said, well, you know, he said, I've been, you know, I've been really, really good. You know, I went to Vietnam, served there, I came back. He's gone through three or four divorces. He said, you know, I've never slept with a married woman. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. I said, have you, have you slept with women? He said, oh, yeah. He said, but I don't sleep with married women. He said, because that's wrong. This is the same conversation, folks. The prejudice conversation, this conversation, same conversation inside the same truck. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. He said, first of all, he said, well, I guess I'm prejudiced. And the second thing he said was, well, I guess I'm a fornicator. <laughs> and today he's saved. Today he's living for the Lord. He's happily married. I married him and his wife. They've been married for years. I mean, God has healed him. You say, he was your friend. Yes, he was my friend. Even though he was prejudiced and he was a fornicator. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you don't have any prejudiced friends, you need to go find some. If you don't have any fornicating friends, you need to go find some. Because believe me, they're out there, right? But you need to understand this role of hospitality. Now, now Derrida, uh, Jacques Derrida, a Jewish, French, Algerian philosopher, a guy I've been doing a lot of study from, he came up with this new word, and if you Google this, you'll find all kinds of stuff. Hospitality. He actually took and synthesized hospitality with hostility and came up with this word, which all comes from the root word hot, H-O-T-E, hot. He synthesized, hot is the word that we get host from, it's the word we get guest from, the word that we get stranger from, these all come from the same root. Hospitality, house, home comes from this word. And so hosting is nothing more than entertaining friends when we're hosting people. Do you understand that? There's no reward in that. And he points out that hospitality and hosting are not the same words. True hospitality is open to that or those that are hostile against us now we're going to go to scripture here in a minute i'm going to show you something i'm going to show you something jesus said you may think that you're being hospitable you may think you are a person of great hospitality but if you're not doing it with those that are hostile it's not hospitality in the first place are y'all getting this making you think this morning you know, I can be open to the homosexual and as equally open to the homophobic. Did you hear what I just said? I can host either. I can host both at the same time. I didn't say they could get along with each other. I said I could do it. Do you know Jesus ate some meals in some place that was not very well accepted? Do you know that Jesus ate with some people that were not very well accepted? He got accused of things like hanging out with sinners. He got accused of, of hanging out with a heathen. And the worst of all, oh my goodness, you didn't do this. He ate with tax collectors. Changed the world. But the importance of hosting is there has to be a house. And so Derrida said, to receive a guest, I am incapable of receiving. It's the possibility of impossible to become capable of that which I am incapable of. It sounds a lot like God. How many of you realize God wants to help you to be capable of that that you're incapable of? And so God used me to minister to people I was unable to minister to. How many of you will pray that deadly prayer today? 
God, help me this year to minister to people I was incapable of ministering to. You see, the impossibility of hospitality makes this discussion even more important to us as Christians. So we open up our houses, we open up our hearts to allergens, that's strangers and foreigners. We host, hope. The hostile take, takeover is what worries most Christians. Christians don't want to go out. Christians don't want to minister. Why? Because they're too worried that somebody's going to try to take them over hostility. Take them over. Be hostile towards them. Well, George Barna and Frank Viola, two of the great, great minds and thinkers, and Barna does all of these church reports for us to understand where the population's at. They wrote this book on pagan Christianity, exploring the roots of our church practices. If I wanted to come down and just really break up your church and your theology and what you believe, I could do it in an instant. Because so much of what we do today came from 4th century. It came from an emperor named Constantine. Constantine got saved and, and he flipped where it was illegal to be a Christian. He just basically said it's illegal to be anything but a Christian. And he began to build basilicas. He began to do things. And so the word ecclesia came out of that time frame. Ecclesia, you know that to be the Greek word for church. But that word was never meant to be church. Ecclesia was always meant to be people. Now at the time they were building buildings and they were staying in, in home churches and renting commercial places made to accommodate crowds of people. They were coming together to have church and the word ecclesia came to mean a gathering or a meeting. Ecclesia is no more a building than it is to say my wife is an apartment. But somehow we think of church as a building. Church is not a building, church is, is people. But if you find your uh, majestic choir performances or beautiful church architecture or dignified clerical vestments or candlelit processions with incense in your worship of God, then you should take pause because none of that's in the Bible. That all came from where? Came from pagan culture. The vestments, the garb, all, it didn't even come from the Jews. They got that from the Romans. They dressed like the Romans dressed incense and waving and all that came from pagans because Constantine was a pagan instead of asking the church he told the church now I could get into great don't have time to get into that but what I want to bring to point is that hospitality comes from a host hospitality is impossible without a house and hostility comes from the same root word. So the key to this is to be welcoming as possible to other people while not surrendering the mastery of one's own house. How many of you know you believe and you host and we have to understand hosting and how we host is that I'm not threatened by the stranger or the visitor that comes through my doors. I'm not threatened by them. But without home, church, or conversing with a stranger, hostility, hospitality is like I said nothing more than mingling but the idea is not entirely other to us unless we first consider it impossible how many of you realize some of this is impossible why do I say it's impossible because you haven't been doing it you haven't been doing it so so let's look at that and so so let's look at messianic hospitality I'm going to get ready to close with this but this is where I want to bring it home is that Jesus operates in this form repeatedly throughout scripture now, I've been staying in the book of Luke because in the book of Luke, there are 10 different meals in which Jesus functions as the host, the, the host or the guest. He functions in that 10 different meals. I don't know if you guys realize this. I've been telling you Jesus did a lot of eating in the Bible. The first commandment in the Bible in Genesis is to what? It's to eat freely. The last commandment in the last book of Revelations is to drink freely. And there's a lot of eating and drinking in between Genesis and Revelations. Jesus called this the table. He was at the table. I, it all relates back to hospitality. So, so there's something especially complex, though, in Luke chapter 7. We're not going to read it for time's sake. Verse 36 Jesus was invited by a Pharisee. The Pharisee was named Simon, and during the meal, a strange woman enters in during the meal, and Jesus welcomes her as if he is the host, not the guest. 
And when the woman kissed Christ's feet and she bathed them with tears, Simon felt hostility. An allergen rose up because, you know, Simon, this is actually his house and Jesus has hosted this woman. She's come in. She's wiping his, his feet with her tears. She's drying his feet with her hair. She's breaking open this box. And, and this is what Simon said. Simon said, if this man were a prophet... He would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. See, that's the my treasure, your junk. That's the my thinking and your foreign thinking thing. So Jesus did two things here. He deconstructed, number one, if you're keeping notes, he deconstructed the Pharisees' hostility, and then he deconstructed the Pharisees' hospitality or his hope. And so Jesus challenged the hostility by telling a story about forgiveness and debt. Jesus went on and he told this story and Simon actually admitted to it that the one for whom the creditor had canceled the greatest debt would love the creditor the most. Why was that woman at the feet of Jesus? Because she had been forgiven much. Then Jesus pointed out that the reviled stranger was actually more hospitable than the religious host Simon was. Jesus rebuffed him by saying this, I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. You see, kissing a guest and bathing their feet were well-known, established Jewish customs. This is how you hosted somebody. Now, Jesus was in the Pharisee's house. The Pharisee was a religious ruler. I'm going to tell you, the dude had a lot of aluminum foil in his house. He didn't realize it. How many of you realize that we got a lot of aluminum foil in our houses and we don't realize it? We think it's safe. But by praising the stranger more hospitable than the host, Jesus exposes the inconsistencies of the Pharisee. He's exposing his aluminum foil. The guest, Jesus... Jesus was the guest. The guest, Jesus, plays host, not in his house, but to the stranger. And Christ's guest, the stranger, acts more hospitable than the host. So we see hostility and hospitality. These elements were both together. Okay? Now, I want to point something out. Jesus' divinity showed most in the sight of hostility. If you want to see God being God, if you want to see Jesus being Jesus, you'll see it more clearly in the midst of hostility. According to Luke, Christian disciples originally considered the resurrection as reported by females to be impossible. Isn't it interesting that Jesus chose women to preach the first message of his resurrection? He chose women. I mean, I, I don't have time to get into what Jesus did for women. It's truly amazing and incredible. A lot of people live by culture rather than truth. Most people, and probably including a lot of people here in the room, just because I haven't taught on it in a while, don't realize there was actually a female apostle in the Bible, but during the, the manly years, they masculinized her name from Junia to Junius. Paul said she was one of the most highly desired apostles. Prophets and so forth, I don't go on and on. But how many of you realize we got our allergens that culture put in us? We worship so much like pagans, but we didn't know that. Culture put that there. In Luke 24, 11, he said, but, but these words seemed to them as an idle tale, and they did not believe them. 
The women told them the truth, and it seemed to them an idle tale, and they would not believe it. But Peter, who was more open, a little bit more open, he ran to the tomb to verify the unthinkable witness of the women. That's Luke 24, 12. And of course, it was true. How many of you know he's risen from the dead? It's true. A woman said it, but it's true. The first preacher of the gospel was women, and it's true. And Peter ran, he said, oh my goodness. But then eventually he conceived of this impossibility that Peter later encountered another, another unthinkable crisis, another thing that was impossible. The unthinkable idea that Gentiles could join Jews in worshiping, the impossibility of the risen Christ to think that we could be together. Those people, those strangers, those foreigners, those people that are not like us. And after receiving a vision from God, Peter finally admitted to Gentiles from Joppa. This is what he said, Acts 10, 28. He said, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. Wow. If you guys are following me, if you're not thinking today, you're not following me. You've got to think to follow with me. So Peter thus exercised hospitality. He exercised hospitality. There's that new word. You can Google it later. He understood the aluminum lining of his house. He began to take back the aluminum. And Jesus is an impossible host. Host. Right after the Emmaus Road event, Jesus exceeded all expectation by suddenly appearing among his disciples, who the Bible says who thought that he was a ghost. And instead of outlining the theological significance of this great event, Jesus requested what was usually considered the traditional sign. What's the first thing Jesus did? What's the first thing Jesus said? Have you any meat to eat? Have you anything to eat? He took and he ate from the broiled fish right there in their presence. And then he explained how his impossible resurrection fulfilled Hebrew scripture. Wow. Christ's actions are echoed in the book of Revelations. You know, the book of Revelations is the revelation of Jesus. It's to show us Jesus. Jesus said this, Revelation 3.20. He said, listen, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice, open the door. I will come into you and be with you and you with me. In other words, and I'm going to close on this point. He said, I will come to eat with you as your guest. How many of you realize that first and foremost in your life, Christ needs to be your guest? He said, listen, I'm I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. If you hear my voice, open the door and I will come into you and eat with you. And then Jesus turns right around and says, and you with me. In other words, he says, I will be your host. Do you recognize him as both guest? and host do you recognize do you see it thus Jesus invites us to eat he invites him to dine he invites us to sit at the table he invites us to have relationship with him then he speaks of theology See, some of you, the problem is you've been trying to get your theology all correct without a relationship. Some of you have been more interested in your argument than you've been interested in your love. Husbands and wives do that all the time. More interested in winning the argument than in sharing the love. People do that at the job site. Christians do that with non-Christians. There's no hospitality exchanged at all. You see, there would be no host, no host, no host, 
if there wasn't an enemy. Let me leave, I'm just, I'm just for time's sake, let me read this. I, I started with it, I'm going to close with it, I promise we're going to take communion. But in Luke 6, 31, remember I told you the golden rule, and as you would that men would do unto you, do also unto them likewise. All right, this is the rest of it, verse 32. For if you love them which love you, what thanks have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thanks have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of hope that you shall receive, what thanks do you have? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much gain. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. If you could help somebody that would later exceed you, it would be your honor. Oh Lord, it would be my honor. I believe 2023 is a year where we host the impossible. I believe 2023, I know for me, a whole decade, I turned 60 in a month, that from 60 to 70, it's about preparing people that will exceed me. Preparing people to go further, to run further, to be stronger, to be bigger, to, be, to do more. And it will absolutely be my honor to do that. But let me ask you, will you help that person? Not that person that you know will never pay you back. It's easier to help that person in all truth. How about that person that you see coming alongside of you and you see passing 